welcome. Welcome to you who are here. Um, our brother David is here again. You know, enjoyed last week so much, he came back this week. Good to have you, brother David. And Evita is back, and a couple of other persons who we haven't seen a little while back. We are so happy to see you. Welcome, especially to those who are online, those who are not yet checked in. Um, please hurry to do so. We are about to start our Bible study. Last week, we looked at the beginning of Mary's response. Where did we stop last week? Anybody? 35. 45. Mm. Oh. Okay. We did all the way to 40. No, man, we never got 40. Mm. Mary leaving to go to, to Elizabeth. Yeah. Remember? No, we never did that. I can't remember that. No. No. I was part of the discussion. We discussed when she was filled with the Spirit, Elizabeth, her response and on what she said. If we could recap it. Yeah, well, let's recap yeah. it then. Let's start at... Um... Start at 41. Or 40. At 40, 40, 41, yes. So, Mary is now at the house of Zachariah. And she greeted... Elizabeth. We don't know what was in the greeting. We have examples of greetings um, that are more detailed in the Bible, but that doesn't mean that it follows a pattern. When, for example, Moses met with his father-in-law in Exodus, and Exodus should be fresh in our mind, there was a special greeting that he, he laid out his father-in-law met him kissed him talked about some other things then they did what they had to do we don't know what the greeting was we don't know what mary said we all we know is that mary they, mary greeted her and mary had her little um dulcimina with her you know what dulcimina is right yeah. well yeah the young people don't know is is that little brown grip like what Margaret brought up when she came up from country? That, that, that little dulcimina. Right. Take, like a cardboard um, suitcase. <laughs> what didn't have zip, but it had the latches. <laughs> so, so Mary was outside with her little dulcimina, and she comes to the house where Elizabeth is. And when she, Elizabeth, heard Mary's greetings, the baby leaped in her womb, and his Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Oh, well. <laughs> you must remember that the baby is what? What do we know about this baby so far? Yes, I was basically saying that John, from what we read in the scriptures, it speaks about this prophet that would go before Christ, and he would prepare the way. And he would preach on repentance um, to the people. So by the time Christ come with the gospel, there would have been a, I mean, he's an important figure in the whole um, manifestation of Christ himself. Okay. Mm -hmm. In light of Mary Elizabeth's response though, what do we know about the baby? Well, as you mentioned, we, we, we can assume based on, on um, the baby's response. 
what, what uh, Mary had said to Elizabeth. And um, John... Oh, we don't need to assume anything. Why would we right. need to assume? Okay. Um, well, the, the exact greetings. No, no. Yes. The baby responded. By leaping. And yes. Elizabeth responded. Right. Elizabeth's response is described. The baby, from the baby was in the womb of his mother, was filled with filled the Holy Spirit. Yeah. No, no, I know everybody said, but nobody moved to the mic to say. Yeah, oh no, Satan, oh no, mind, and oh no, guessing. We, we read this earlier when we were in chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 15. The angel pronounced to Zechariah what will happen to this baby. Right. Now we have to get in the habit of looking at what scripture says, looking for cues from the scripture first, rather than making it up by the whim. Right? Verse 15 tells us that this child will be filled with the spirit from the womb. John the Baptist will be filled from, with the spirit from the womb. So when you come to here now and you see the response of the baby in his mother's womb towards Mary, who is now the mother of the promised Messiah, it shouldn't shock us that he's responding in this way, right? Right? Amen. Chapter 1, verse 15. Get our cues from the scripture. So Mary was, uh, Elizabeth was also what? And what does that mean to be filled with the Spirit? I don't hear. I need to go. But can't hear unless you go to the mic. There's people don't hear either. <laughs> oh God. To be filled with the Spirit is to be under the control of the Spirit. So, this wasn't Elizabeth jumping up and burbing out tongues, screaming out and rolling and carrying on, running around the house like it on fire or anything like that. This is Elizabeth. Now being moved by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit moved first on the child and then on Elizabeth. What is this? This is confirmation to Mary. Mary just heard that Elizabeth was going to be with child. Mary caught the first bus down packed stuff and was there with her little bag. When Elizabeth saw her, the child first reacted. The child reacted to whom? It's not so much Mary, you know, but it's who is inside uh, of Mary. Uh. Right? So he reacted as forerunner to the Messiah that was in Mary's stomach. Then Elizabeth no, without hearing anything, or we're not sure if Mary said anything to her, Elizabeth, under the Holy Spirit, starts to cry out with a loud voice. So Elizabeth was loud. She wasn't whispering to Mary. She was very loud. Yes, the excitement. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of of your womb. What made her blessed among women? That's right. Her, God's choice of her. God's choice of her blessed her. It was a blessing for God to have chosen her. Mary had expressed that before. No. Elizabeth affirms the pregnancy and says, Blessed is the fruit of your womb. For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. See? So the baby was excited about what is to come. It is amazing that we see a child not yet born in the womb of his mother excited about Jesus and those who saw him were not. 
those who saw him were not. So she pronounces a blessing. And this is normative. But here is something that we see about Elizabeth. An expression. And how has it happened to me? That the mother of my Lord would come to me. How has it happened to me? Is Elizabeth questioning what is happening? No. It's part of our proclamation. It's an expression of humility. How is it that God would bless me too that I would be inside of all of this? There is excitement. And, 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 and um, Elizabeth expresses it with humility. How could this happen to me? And here is the thing. The mother of whom? My Lord. It is this verse that, and others, I guess, that um, Catholicism would use to say, Mary, mother of God. Mother of God. The blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Right. Holy Mary. So all of that comes from this passage of scripture. But Mary is not called mother of God anywhere in the scriptures. She's mother of the Messiah. She's ma mother of the incarnate Christ. Yes? Yes? Um, interesting. Um, did Elizabeth knew personally, I know that the angel said to Mary when he went that your cousin Elizabeth is pregnant. So she would have known that Elizabeth was pregnant. What, my, what I'm trying to wonder is that, did Elizabeth have um, the idea that Mary was carrying Christ, the Lord? Read verse 4. And the reason, yes, that's why, I, because I never wanted to jump and assume Read, that. What does verse 41 tell you? Yes, that I'm saying it's, it's, prof, it's revealed to her by virtue no, of this. We don't know that. Oh, well. See, we don't know what yes, she greeted her and say, so we cannot yeah. say with any certainty that Mary said it or it happened then. Yeah. What, what, but what we do know is that her, her proclamation is moved by the Spirit. That's the point I'm saying. So she's not guessing. Yes. She's not speaking out of her Spirit. own emotion yes. or volition. Yes, it's coming from yeah? the Spirit of God. So what the text is telling you? is that the Spirit yeah. of God gave her the utterance to say that's what she was saying in terms yes, of that magnificence. Yes, yes, that's it. Mm. So, the baby, baby leaped for joy in my womb. Verse 45. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. <laughs> I was waiting for you to get there. So, I remember when we were having, I think it was the first time, the discussion, the discussion about, the discussion about um, Zachariah versus uh, Mary, and the conversation was, how did we know that she believed, you know? So this, I would imagine that the scripture is telling, because Elizabeth is now saying that she believed. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm just saying observation, because I, I recall the discussion, right. mm -hmm. the extended discussion that we had, yeah. and you were saying that, oh, wait until we get there. So I yeah. guess this is there. It affirms. It yes. affirms, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because her, her belief is demonstrated before this proclamation by Elizabeth. The, the fact, fact that she get up and pack her dosi minion yes. and go down to Elizabeth, so she believed because Elizabeth was an old yeah. woman. Yeah. So you get an announcement say the whole woman pregnant, Ordinary us, well, me, because we're not saved, made a kiss me teeth and said, sure, um, Elizabeth, it was one old woman, we're not going to waste my time. So her disposition and her, her response, belief is not measured by what people have up here, by their response. Her response tells us that. Yeah. Um. Um, <laughs> yes. 
Order 3 is, is very instructive because um, it tells about Elizabeth's faith. And she didn't just say the mother of, it is my, she personalized it. Mm -hmm. The mother of my Lord has come to visit me. Yeah. Personalized, mm -hmm. show her faith and the belief and what, what, what she has told and her belief system. But we don't know if she was told, but what, what it shows is that the Holy Spirit led her to affirm who was in Mary's stomach. What was in, yeah. You remember, one of Mary's questions was, how can this happen? We had spent much, night, much of the night discussing that. It was, it, was not, it was not an expression of doubt, but, but an expression of um, Mary's it was just incredible to Mary for her to think that a woman could get pregnant without a man. So the expression was not if it can happen, but how is it going to happen? Hence, so the angel answered Mary um, and told her. But one of the things that is striking is that part of the affirmation that the angel gave to Mary was, was Elizabeth's pregnancy. He says, you think is you one pregnant? Elizabeth down there, six months now she gone. Elizabeth, six months now she gone. So Mary finds herself there. Not, not, no, verse 37. For nothing is impossible with God. And what is clear from that is that Elizabeth did not come, become pregnant because of um, Zachariah's prowess. Elizabeth's pregnancy is an act of God because of the timetable and purpose of God that he was about to, uh, um, to, to roll out. So, this is an act of God. The child is an act of God. Um, so here is Mary, and Elizabeth says, Blessed is she who believes, believed that there would be fulfillment in what had been spoken to her by the Lord. <laughs> What's up? Uh, uh, go ahead. Let me talk about so, it, 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 that, that verse reaffirms what we were saying earlier on about um, what happened with Zach, Zechariah in, in, in his dumbness, his response to the word of the Lord. We see an angel came to him and, and announced, but the angel did not come to him of his own accord. Mm -hmm. it's, it's instructive to us too about our own response to the word of the Lord. Whether we read it in our devotion or we hear it at bible study or we hear it from the pulpit what is our response to that even though it is a man who speaks it mm -hmm. our disposition to god's word and it's interesting that that mary in her in her affirmation in singing in this magnificat here points back to the source of, the, of, of, of this promise, the source mm -hmm. of this word, who is God. And what does he say? Blessed is the person, well, it's Mary in this case, who believed God's word. Mm -hmm. Who believed God's word. And this belief is demonstrated, as we say, through action. Right. Hmm? Right. But, but you know what is strange? Um, since we're talking about belief and, and all of this, is I have had discussion this week at least three or four times with, with Christians. And, and every time I get from them the idea that obedience is a choice. In, well, it, it is, but it it's depends not a on, on what you, what, in it's what not sense. a choice. We have, well, we have to choose to obey. 
Now, that you choosing to obey it don't mean that that is a choice. You're required to obey it. Yeah. I understand right? that, but when they say it's a choice, what do they mean? That is what, they're not entirely wrong to well, say it's a choice. Well, they go and they, they, they further cement that by saying, God gave us freedom of choice. Oh, to disobey. Oh, well, <laughs> you know, um, obedience is a requirement. It's a requirement, yeah. When, when the law says do not go more than 35 miles and all, it's not how you feel about it. It's not whether you want to, yes or no. You are required to obey. To not obey is direct defiance against the authority of the land. So, it, so it's not optional. Not optional. But it is a choice that we make. But you, because you, the Holy Spirit itself won't come to make us obey. No. There are some of us who are praying and fasting for God to make us, um, Lord, I'm struggling with this. Um, and I'm going through 21 day and fast and pray for me to stop. Do it. So I, we have to just stop. We make that choice. But it's not optional for us to decide, oh, I'm going to obey or not. It's a requirement. And so we must do it. It's a command. But we get this idea that we don't have to obey. Yeah. You know. God understands. This, this is a very interesting discussion um, that doesn't fit well with most of Jamaican church scene mm -hmm. about how the Holy Spirit works in our lives. Galatians 5 says, walk in step with the Spirit. It's the same passage that talks about the Spirit-filled life. Is, yeah. Okay? Um, and how do we get filled with the Spirit or how, how do we manifest the filling of the Spirit? we have to choose to walk in step with the Spirit. And what that suggests, when you link it up with a passage like Luke 17, where a passage that we oftentimes quote out of context where Jesus says, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, mm. you shall say to the mulberry bush, be, be uprooted and... Mountain and move, move, yeah. Okay? That is in response to the question, or the, or the command that Jesus gives to forgive your brother when he offends you. How many times? Seven times? I mean, three times? Up to seven times, Jesus says in one day. And Peter says, Lord, increase our faith. Mm -hmm. And then Jesus says, if you have faith of a mustard seed, then you shall do this. In our words, just as Damien just said, we do not need any more power to obey. Okay? What we have is the Holy Spirit in us. And what we now need, need, what we now need to do is walk in step with the Spirit, which means if the Spirit said, go there, sir, we're gone right behind him, gone over there, sir. It's difficult because of our own, the nice big word that they use while ago, volition. We, we sometimes feel that oh, we don't have enough control of our will, but it's because we are not yielded to the Spirit. And, you know, whatever it is, God said, leave that girl there alone, and you're, and you're a girl that. You can walk away. Mm. The, 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 the truth is, as you say, though, we don't exercise that. We don't exercise. We, 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 there are so many things that are so foreign to the biblical truth that we have embraced as truth. Um, in, in, in the same breath like that is the same thing where we're always praying for revival. What are you praying for revival for? We need a revival. Things are just dead. What caused it to be dead? It's your work that caused it to be dead. Your relationship that causes it to be dead. What you're praying about? You need to start leaving it out. Yes, you know. But we, we have this. Yeah, we see a Troy and we want to welcome Troy and Michelle. Um, they tried to see if they could get permanent visas based on COVID. Never worked out, so they were deported recently. Welcome back. So, Mary believed that there would be fulfillment. That is just tough to ask somebody to believe that. It's tough. But not if you consider who God is. And, and right through, that's what you hear happening. Because when Mary says, how that will happen, 
And he says, the most high will overshadow you. First of all, he declares, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. And the most high will overshadow you. Right? And for this reason, the holy child shall be called. So he's, he's, he's telling her that this is a work of God. That God going to accomplish this with his own might, with his own power. And he uses the word that we talked about um, when he called God Most High, El Elyon. Which depicts God's sovereignty and omnipotence and ruler of, as ruler of heaven and earth. You know, that God can make it happen. The funny is that um, here is Mary having a child without a man, and Elizabeth having a child um, eggs. without <laughs> eggs. <laughs> you know, um, and 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 both of them are against the rules of nature. But God is not chained to what nature dictates. God is not bound by what nature dictates. God acts outside of nature because he is the originator of the laws of nature. He is the one who put these things into rule. You know, um, there's a verse that says, and I love this verse, it's in Job, I think, um, that God draws a line and the waves obey it. You, you, you would never get that picture unless you lived somewhere by the sea, right? Um, I grew up in Harborview, and there is a side to Harborview that we used to call Big Sea as children. You know what that is? It's Caribbean terrace side, where it's rough, it's the ocean, where it's, it's deep, it's not, it's not for the faint-hearted. So people like myself would go and wet her foot and, and come back home. You, you don't go past anywhere past your knee. Because the current comes in with such force and pulls. And what is amazing is when they built this place, um, Caribbean Terrace, all the houses to the side, to the sea, the retaining wall was this low. You would just walk and step over and go to the beach. But it was not beach to the sea, you know. Um, only only the, 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 the strong swimmers, and you could count them on one hand and have change, would dare to swim in it, you know. It, the waves were, sometimes they would look like, I mean, skyscrapers coming in. But don't care how they looked. When they got to the place, they would just break, and just roll gently in. Never reached the wall yet. Never reached the wall. And I used to be amazed, you know, until I came across this verse. I used to be amazed as a child. I said, boy, these people really brave enough you know, to come put up house right here. So and then they make this man give them this little wall. I mean, something way up there, you know. But it never passes the line that God draws. It is God who is in charge of nature and not the other way around. Nature is not no mother. It's the creation of God. And the creation obeys God. Obeys God. So here is God through his creative ordinance commanding one woman who is too old to have children and one woman who never knew a man to have one. And it is just amazing. So, so when you take into consideration the Christmas story, you know, I think sometimes we overlook these things of the hand of God and how um, he providentially makes his purpose come to pass. And, 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 and sometimes we, we miss Christmas. What Christmas is really about. You know, we, we miss Christmas with, with God's great provision of his son in this miraculous fashion. This is, this is awesome, you know. It's here how awesome it is. And Mary said, Mary's response of worship, my soul exalts the Lord and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. What is Mary saying? With my total being, I lift up God. 
Remember, David said something similar to that? Not this one. David said, um, when he cried out to his soul. Uh, my soul and all that. Yes. Right. You know, when, when he commands his soul to praise God, you know, Mary is worshiping God because of who God is. It's not out of pregnancy that Mary is worshiping God because of who God is. Oh, we know that because she's going to say, for he has regarded from the humble state his bondservant slave. So she affirms again her yieldedness to God by calling herself bond slave. Paul does that throughout the scriptures. Paul does that throughout the scripture. You have to understand that when Paul does that, you know, Paul is moving from a place of pride to a place of submission. Paul was a trained man in the laws. And his, his, his rabbi was, was the most proficient of them all. So when Paul walked, you know, I mean, he had nailed up in his room that certificate of graduation from him. Because it meant a lot. You know, so, so here is Paul persecuting the church and God book, um, meets him on the highway and humbles him. And humbles him. And, 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 and from then on, and, and what did God say? Paul, why are you kicking against the prick? Don't you understand? It's, it's futile to stand against God. That's the point. You know, it's futile to stand against God. It's futile to stand in, God, in the way of God's purpose. It's futile to think that you can block what God is, is, is doing. It's an act of futility. And we need to adopt an attitude of servitude. Where we recognize God for who he is and humbly lay ourselves there. You know, um, he has regarded my humble state. God has lifted me up. God has lifted me up. Um, can we say that? Did God lift us up? You know, the Bible says, whilst we were yet what? Enemies of God. That God moved to lift us up. Um, another passage says that you, he has adopted as sons. And if he has adopted you as sons, then you are heirs. And if you are heirs, it means you are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. You know, what an elevation. What a place that he has put us to. You know, when we talk about um, blessed and highly flavored, what do we really understand by that? Do we understand the elevation that God has brought us to? Mary says, how could God even consider me? And I know we don't see salvation in that light most often. No, we don't. No, we don't. We take for granted salvation all too often. But how could God choose me? This is what Mary is literally saying. What did I do for God to choose me? Absolutely nothing. How did God select me? Because the Bible says, before the very foundation of the earth, Christ died for us. Um, Mary's, what Mary says here seems antithetical or uh, seems, that's, uh, give me a word for antithetical seems contradictory to the reality of the position that this announcement placed her in. Because very often, I think we read this and we see this as Mary just entering into something that was easy for her to obey and to accept and to yield to. Or is Mary, and because she's carrying Jesus, Oh, Jesus, this is easy for her. And I want to score this because we think obedience has to be something that comes easy. Mm -hmm. We think that obedience has to come something that is magical and falls from the sky upon us. Mary, by virtue of the law that she was living under, 
was facing or could have possibly faced the death penalty for being now pregnant. Ordinarily, somebody in Mary's position should have been running by some doctor back way, somebody drink peas root, something to get rid of this. So this is not an easy situation Mary is in to obey, to say, your bond servant. And mind you, Mary is no special, no more special than us in that she didn't have any special abilities that we don't have. As a matter of fact, we have the indwelling Holy Spirit. We might have been more privileged than Mary, but what is our response? What is our response when we're, we're not facing death penalty? When we're told simple things like forgive, when we're told simple things like mind your business, in my meaning don't um, backbite and gossip. When we're told simple things like we called, you are called to service, We're not facing nothing, but we find it difficult. Those are the things that we say God understands for. Mm. But look at Mary's response. A young, quote-unquote, naive girl who is facing danger responds in this way. So when we read this Magnificat, no, not this Magnificat, when we read Mary's song, we must read it with that understanding that this, this is Her response amazes me. It amazes me. And it says that this was a young girl of great faith. We, we want faith to raise dead people. Mm. Enough people go to a funeral. In this year, Jamaica, let me see with my own two front eye. And praying for dead people to wake up. That's the faith we want. We want faith to pray for sick people to get well, but not faith to obey. Think about it for two seconds. I just need it to stick up here. The first three verses, Mary centers on what God has done for her. Did you notice that? It's all about what God has done for her. And, 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 and that sets a pattern to us too. In our worship towards God, are we, we sang a while, are grateful. Are we grateful? Are we just like the song? The song nice. Yes, the song nice. The song nice. Are we grateful? She's grateful for God's honor, God's call, God blessing her. And then she says, from now on, people recognize God that you have blessed me. See that? Verse 48. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me, will consider me blessed. <laughs> yes. You know, which, which is that. You know, um, how do we respond to God's call? God's call. To too many of us, is 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 just too much. God wants too much from me. Mm. We don't have the time. We don't have the time. It's not even so much when we have the time; is when we decide so we want to do it. Right now, we're young and we're trying to get an education. We're trying to move up in life. We're trying to accomplish what we want, our own dreams, our own aspirations. It was a dream of Mary to be married. I tell you that already, you know. Come on, somebody. I tell you that already. You know, so when ladies come to me, you know, David, I'm talking about, no, man, I'm fine. You know? <laughs> they must be talking how them look, but how them fine. It can't be that they're, because it is, it is the desire of everyone. 
to get married, to have a family, to have someone by your side and, you know, it's, it's, it, it does not always remain the desire because of choice sometimes. Some people having cho chosen wish that they had not made a choice and they were better off single. But the point is there's Mary who's looking forward with everything to get married. Probably thinking and planning how much children she's going to have. And Joseph, now have much money enough, but Joseph is a carpenter. So we're going to buy and save and get some wood so we can, you know, put a little extension. So when we have the first child, we can put up a little bedroom for them, you know. And then, and then later on, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's not a thing Joseph don't have to buy. <laughs> Mary probably, I mean, I order for breakfast and everything already. But the point is that she's dreaming of this. And in the midst of her dream, it's interrupted with purpose. Purpose sometimes interrupts us. As I dare say, purpose most times interrupts us. It's not this needed plan. Yes. Listen, you weren't on my mind. Don't think that I sat down daily dreaming one day when I went stand before people and preach. Oh, no. That was never a part of my plan. That was never my goal. You know? I was well on my way doing very well. Yeah. I say it all the time. 25 and your house pay for. And you're looking for a bigger house. 25 and you're on your fourth BMW. Ultimately 25 dollars. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's not a show off. It's just to show you the track that I was on. And God just come and interrupts all of that and say, hey, remember when they talk about Bible school and he was at Utah? It's time. You mean by his time? Oh, we're going to work that now. Let's work it out. And, and I, pay, I made a plan for God. You know, I was going to go up, find a school in Florida, so I can go part-time, three days, maybe two days at, two to three days at the week, fly down back, run the business, just go up for the, and then, you know, we see how it work out when I finish. And, and the Bible school move and they never tell me. Application in, acceptance letter in, and they never tell me. And you know why I saw that? Mm -mm, this is not God's plan. Not God's plan. Every Bible school I applied to put something in the way that was not God's plan. But you couldn't escape the call. You could run till you blew. You can't escape God, Scott. And here I was with, with all of that on me, and I said, all right, Lord, tomorrow morning we're going to the embassy. We're going to check out a school in Florida, because it's Florida we work out this thing for. That's my work. And get up to the embassy, and embassy closed. It was July 4th. Who didn't know anything about American holiday? So I called down to my office, and I said, there's a huge contract waiting for us to take up. And I said, get the people together. We're going to take up this contract. We're going to take up this contract. Get all the staff. We're going to make plans to take up this contract. Huge contract. Come down, quite convinced. God, Bible school enough for me. And get inside, and my sister hands me a letter from a friend who has been studying for the past five years abroad, who never write me one time. But I see them all the time, you know, when they come home. Five years and here's a letter from them. But I didn't read the letter um, from them, the note from them. I read what the letter said. Dear Brother Hall, who is called my brother? We are pleased to inform you that you have been accepted. Accepted to what? As a student of Carver Bible College, this 
Wrong address, Joe. Mm -hmm. I never applied for nothing. Mm -hmm. And there was a stick note. And from my friend's wife, who says, Dear Junior, I don't think she even knew how God was using her. I looked, um, the other day it occurred to me that you had mentioned some time ago about Bible school. And I just felt the urge to write up an application in your name. I work in the dean's office and I spoke to him. This is the result. You can choose to do with it what you want. I had three weeks to leave Jamaica. Three weeks to leave Jamaica. Blessed God. Never felt like a blessing. <laughs> never, it never... There was no rejoicing. There was no rejoicing. There was perplexity. Not in the sense like Mary's perplexity, but more in the sense of, of um, Zach Zachariah's perplexity. What is this God is doing now? Hmm? And, 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 then you, and then you negotiate. Well, God, I can be a good Christian businessman, a good Christian lawyer. I can serve in the church just the same. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I tried everything. As a matter of fact, I pressed so much in undergrad because I needed to come back as quickly as possible. And I crammed four years of study into three. Into three, my final year without doing any summers. No summers, no Christmas. It was just... The every year when I signed up for courses, the, the, the dean would say to me, you have to get approval from the, um, from the academic dean. And the academic dean would just sign it and say, well, if him fail, it's on him. And the dean would say, the last, I remember the last year that the dean kept saying to him, this, it can't happen, this, you can't just make him do that. And the academic dean said, well, if him fail, we sure that him couldn't do it. And what better proof is there? Than to, than to just tell him same can't be. In my final year of school, I did 37 credit hours in order to graduate. 37. Why? Wasn't to prove that us brightest to come home. The business going down. <laughs> Bring up back the business. And again, God interrupt my plans. Gave me a full scholarship to go and do my graduate studies at Dallas. I cried. I cried. I went down to Dallas. I saw the school magnificent. Magnificent. I mean, when you say, magnificent. The library was something to behold. The school campus was something to behold. And all in my mind was, who down here for me to behold God? I don't know a soul down here. There are two other Jamaicans on campus. I grew to five of us by the time. And on the way back, I pulled up on the road and I said, Lord, what is he doing to me? Texas? After me, he's not no cowboy. I wept, tears flowed down my face because God interrupted me again. Always purpose. Unlike interrupt. Mary, he wasn't grateful for the call. No. Don't be like him. Be like Mary. No, in reflection. Yes. No, you're grateful. Of course. More than grateful. No, I wouldn't have traded it for anything in the world. No, I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't. No, I understand the value of it. And I understand the satisfaction of being blessed by being in obedient to God. It is not monetary blessing. David will affirm that with me. Right? Yeah, birds of a feather. <laughs> when you don't have any money, you keep friends with poor people so you can show off of them if they have any more, or you have any more than them. And, and we, we work it that way. It's not the material blessing. It's not anything like that. 
It, it is the joy of watching people's lives change. It is the joy of discovering that you're walking in God's purpose. It is the satisfaction of that, not the joy, the satisfaction of knowing that you are where God wants you to be, doing what God wants. And there is nothing that can compete with that. Of course, life hard. You think life is easy? You think things go according to plan because you're walking here? The greatest challenge to have stayed in it. And it continues to be a challenge to stay in it. Challenge every single day to stay in it. But God. So here is Mary. Um, she walking in God's purpose to, you know, she should meet me. <laughs> For the mighty, most of them didn't get that, they sleeping, you know. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. So she's, first of all, grateful for God's personal um, interaction in her life. She's grateful for what God has done. She's grateful for his elevation. She's grateful for his call. She recognizes the blessing that God would consider. But it's a blessing. Just think about it. It's a blessing for God to consider us, you know. So, And his mercy is upon generation after generation. So she goes on and she recognizes that God's grace and mercy is not only extended to me, you know. Like what, what, what we say, no. It's extended to us. And, and there is no end to it. There is no cornering or any trickling of it. I know David dying to say something, so we'll soon give him the opportunity after this. You know? Uh, and, 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 and generation after generation will experience the mercy of God. You know, and, and it is, it is, it is not out of place that Mary is highlighting his mercy. Because in Romans chapter 9, Paul highlights that mercy, that salvation, is a direct result of mercy. Salvation is a direct result of mercy. We tend to talk about grace a lot, but not enough about mercy. But we are saved because God had mercy. That's what Paul that God himself declares it. Paul quotes him in Romans chapter 9, where he says, um, where God says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. Mercy belongs to him. And he passes it on from generation to generation, which tells us that his mercy will never run out towards those who fear him. He has done mighty deeds with his arm. So she's exalting God for his power. He has scattered those who are proud in their thoughts of their hearts. So she talks about God dealing with those who would oppress people. These are the oppressive folks now. Those that have pride in their hearts. Brought down rulers from their thrones. Those who exercise might over people. And he, ex he has exalted those who are humble. You know. And humble is not so much an attitude, but an estate. You know. That you find yourself in a humble estate. You know. Some of you don't know what it is to be in a humble estate. You know. It, it, <laughs> But it, it would appear that even in this, 
Mary is, this, this song of praise is also revolutionary theology for, mm -hmm. for, for them. Mary is rejecting accepted ideas of, of, of God being near to the, to the rich. And, 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 and she's talking about God lifting up now those who are humble. That, that, is, that is revolutionary. Because the idea was that you, you're, you're rich and, and God close to you. Hold yeah? on. Hold on. Hold on. That's not old theology. That's, that's, that is fresh theology. That's what we believe now. What, what? That, that the blessings well, of so God much, is, is an indication not so of. then because church full of poor people. So. Who are all aspiring to be rich. You leave out that part. It's just why them claiming it and naming it. Yeah, but, but that challenge to, to, to... That challenge to privilege and to... To, 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 to a particular kind of status quo um, resonates there because Mary is responding led by the spirit and she's challenging something systemic go ahead you yeah. perhaps could express it i uh, know um you say it's revolutionary but it really wasn't it only seems revolutionary because the people of god have always ignored his word have always ignored his word oh. because through the old testament we see ex that's what mary got it, it from yeah. That's how Mary got it from. Mary got it from the teachings of the Old Testament. This is how God was. God has always upset the apple cart. He always chose the, he reject the first born and choose the second born and the third born or whatever it is. David comes to mind. Okay, he, an eighth born. He, he, he takes a despised like Joseph and rises him up to the top. He takes the one who is stumbling with speech to make him go and speak to Pharaoh. This is a pattern of God. Right. But the people of God have always kept their eyes on the outside and want to be like other people. Right. So it's, it's re revolutionary. The re reason I say revolutionary, because we just finished Exodus. And right. when you see all of those provisions God made for, right. for the disadvantage. Revolutionary when you consider what was status quo. Yes, most and, definitely. And, and, and almost now, even, even this that we're teaching would seem revolutionary. In, 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 in what is status quo for, for, for the church to kind of want to, as Pastor was saying just now, ascribe to, to getting a seat at the table of power. Right, right. Uh, and, 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 and seeing that as we have arrived, rather than dismantling so that all of us are lifted kind of thing. In, in Jamaica today, it sounds revolutionary because I look at this like a poor church. Paltry, 25 people. Okay, you guys are wasting your time. If Barry start to preach some good, nice message and promise you that exactly what you're talking about, you know, the things that you're going to this place, pack out. You wouldn't be here. In fact, you'd be gone to a hotel or something like that. Because that's what the people of God want. The people of God want, you know, want to know that they are healthy and wealthy and wise, whatever it is. When God has this thing of using the foolish things of the world to reach to the world. So the problem is not that you are a fool enough. It's whose fool are you? Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we see a lot of Christians who are foolish for the things of the world that promise a lot and deliver nothing. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty-handed. God provides. The problem is we all too often don't want his provision. We want our desires. It's a huge problem in the church. So there's not a satisfaction with what God has provided. Because we want something else. He has given help to Israel, his servant. She goes back 
And now she recognizes that this blessing that is coming is not hers. It's not hers. You know, yeah, <laughs> you, you know, we, we, we sometimes do that, you know. Um, why you think the Corinthian church desired the sign gifts? Because they thought it was theirs. They want something to show off with. Something that they thought set them apart, that made them better than. Same thing we do in church. There is no humility, and there is no recognition that all that I am and I have is for him, for his glory, to the benefit of the people. We talked about that, where the Bible says that the gift you got is so what? The, 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 the education and lifting up of the church. But you think, no, it's for me to get up there and talk, call myself prophet. An apostle. You know? You, you think that. That's why people want titles. That's why they want, they want a special recognition. I see them every day. In the spirit of Jezebel. In the Old Testament. I see them every day. Prophesying, so-called, when it's bad teaching. Jezebel didn't die or is to come. Jezebel continues. And the people of God succumb to these things. Yeah, you can't be, nobody wants it. I have not heard anybody call themselves servant of God. Once. No, don't no, those things, no. We have to speak these things into being, and God, you're the head and not the tail. And that God didn't make it all. Yeah, you know, all these, we, we come with these jargons. <laughs> yeah, we come with these jargons as if, as if, you know, it, it makes up special. No. Mary recognizes that this is not hers to hold to. It reminds me of, um, what's your name in Samuel? Where is your name again? Uh, Anna. Anna. Hey, let's come here and I don't want to remember you. <laughs> I should just walk into you now. I wonder why. Yeah. Anna longed for a child. So that everybody would stop looking down at her. Longed for a child so she could show her husband. That boy, it, it was no wrong movie make to take her. Longed for a child to wipe disgrace and shame out her eyes. But Hannah didn't long for the child to satisfy her own desires. Hannah said, Lord, I've given him back to you. I've given him back to you. And Anna does something that is incredible. And I know if today God was going to call her Anna, he probably would have to make her. From scratch. To say that you long for a child and now you have one, you're giving him back to the Lord. Give what back? Serious. I'm serious. This is how we live. And you wonder, when we read Hebrews and we talk about the hall of faith where they're all watching and encouraging us, what are they encouraging us to? This church today, I, wa I wonder, they must have won a rich race this. You, you ever got, you know, I used to say, like when you got champs. I used to see some local team running and you never know the school colors, much less the school. And you turn on and you look in your book and you say, which race is this? It's almost insignificant. Because the people not running. We're not, we're not into this. We, we're into us. She brought, she recognized that Jesus was bigger than her. 
And Jesus had to remind her later on, you know, remember he did? Remember he did? Mm -hmm. Yes, man. When David and all of them, they go to the wedding. Coming back, the children would run up and down. There's like a caravan and they would play and things. So if them didn't even miss Jesus, it wouldn't, it, it, it wouldn't be unnatural. But it's after a while, they said, but you should have come home, come eat already. <laughs> you are there. I just mentioned it. <laughs> You're in the caravan, playing. <laughs> you know? And, and, and she just missed, she said, Joseph, Jesus, come get you. You see Jesus? No, I don't see him, you know. You know, come home, come eat. No. I must say, eat with them friend then. But when it takes too long, no, because boy, don't care which friend the mother supposed to start going to your mother now. You know, like when you, you saw all of them start shaking their head and them devil, you are saying. When you used to go over your neighbor's house and the mother said to you, all right, go home now, to, go home now. <laughs> yeah. Margaret, I hope you don't say that to them. <laughs> I never got sent to my yard. Neither me, because I couldn't leave mine. <laughs> the last time I leave mine, I get beaten. I couldn't leave mine. You go again. You have a question? And, well, I st uh, yeah, I was just making an observation. Um, you guys would have highlighted it, but let me say it. Um, when we saw Mary making that contrast between the poor and the rich in terms of how God's dealing in relation to the context of what we are dealing with, that... He would look on somebody who would be oh the insignificant, the one who is overlooked, the, the one who nobody not really big. This is the stone, the sticks and the stones. But those God purposed to do, and it in a sense He uses that to actually magnify what He's doing because it it, it is even more um, what you call it now more awesome in and of itself when God does it that way because. Why I said that is that when you use people, and I'm going to connect it back with when Jesus said to the Pharisees, I'm not come to call the, 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 the righteous, but sinners and to repentance because the healthy don't need a doctor or a physician, but the sick does. And what he's basically trying, that when we become so self-absorbed in our own abilities and our strengths and all of that, we are not able to be used effectively by God because we are the center man. We are the one who is at the center of everything. But as the, um, the songwriter says that um, in the light, what, what is the song? It says, things go strangely dim, right? Oh, in the, yes. yes. <laughs> in, in essence, what you are becomes insignificant before God. So much so that you are able to be used by him because the things that you have, your accolades, all that you have achieved are really, are really tools to be used, with, used for him. Yeah. Before the songwriter. Yes, did. Yes. <laughs> so Mary acknowledged that God has blessed the nation of Israel. Um, he has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy. As he spoke to our fathers, Abraham and his descendants forever. Genesis 17, verse 19. So she remembers that the fulfillment of this is a promise that God made, and God now manifests this promise with this child, his servant Israel. God has blessed. It's amazing when you read this and you see the general response. And Mary stayed about three months and then returned to her home. That means Elizabeth was how many, many, many months pregnant now? Nine. Nine. At the end of it. Yes. Now the time had come. Now, for, for, for most of the men who don't know, nine months is usually the time when the child is born. Yeah. Um, so now the time had come for Elizabeth to give birth. See, he's, 
meandering through the lives of both of them. It's time for Elizabeth to give birth. So you stopped with Mary. As I highlighted everything about Mary's and her response and everything. He goes back into um, Zachariah and Elizabeth. Now the time had come for Elizabeth to give birth, and she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and her relatives had heard that the Lord had displayed his great mercy towards her, and they were rejoicing. How do you think that they considered God's great mercy being displayed towards her? Hmm? Yes. Because she finally have something now. She's not walking around with teddy bear anymore. She has a child. Right. Mm -hmm. You checking on that, right? Mm. Um, so everybody come now and everybody celebrate. It's common in Israel um, that they would celebrate. They do not normally celebrate the birth of a girl child, per se. They would rejoice at a male child. You read the Psalms. And it, it says, blessed is a woman whose quiver is filled with sons. So boys were considered a blessing um, in that society. They were going to come nonetheless because the fact that she could have a child this old is something to celebrate. And they are rejoicing with her, you know, because her joy by this time is uncontainable. And her, and, and her joy is unique because right through she recognizes this is not an ordinary baby. It's not an ordinary baby she's having and it's not an ordinary baby Mary having. This is God's whole plan that he has put together. So it's a unique situation and they have gathered with her. And they are even rejoicing greater because she has a son. See? And her neighbors and her relatives heard that the Lord had displayed his great mercy towards her. And they were rejoicing with her. And when, and it happened that on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child. That is according to Leviticus 12. That requires circumcision. You, you know what circumcision is, right? The removal of the foreskin of the penis on a child. So I, I can just imagine in that time, oh, that poor child must have cried. Um, they would probably just hold it, pull it, stretch it, and take a sharp flint and just cut it off. It, well, it needs to be done at eight days because if it happened any later, that boy probably wouldn't walk and talk anymore. You know, but, but um, and then they would put the herbs, whatever it is, to prevent it from getting infected. This must have been traumatic on a child, you know. But, no, <laughs> yeah, no nothing. It's, it's just what they did. And they did it out of obedience to God. It was symbolic because it set them apart from the other nation. I can't help but notice that the neighbors, them never bad mind. Never what? Bad, bad mind. mind. Oh. No, no it, 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 it seemed funny. But they rejoiced with her. Bad mind is a thing. They, when people receive blessing or, or difficulty to rejoice with them, demonstrate something. And these neighbors are here rejoicing with her, being really happy for her. And it underscores what our response should be towards each other too. So let's not miss these, just jump over these things. That Bible says that we must rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Imagine if that was the other way around. If we wept when people were rejoicing, and we rejoice where people wept. Yeah, there's something to be said about that.
Um, as, as Damien mentioned, um, the neighbors rejoicing. Um, a scripture came to mind. Um, when, when someone's ways is pleasing to the Lord, even the Lord causes even his enemies to be at peace mm -hmm. with him. And um, as you mentioned, the neighbors rejoicing, that came to mind. Um, as you say, bad mind is real, it is active, but um, the peace of the Lord, even your neighbor, even your enemies, will be at peace with you. Just wanted to share. I just want to assure you that we are rejoicing with In you. New shoes. New shoes. <laughs> <laughs> new pants. <laughs> A new shirt. <laughs> we, we, we rejoice and we try. <laughs> You could put on something to look a little bit. <laughs> yeah, we are all at one. Why don't be like Michelle? <laughs> Michelle bringing it out a little at a time. <laughs> we rejoice with you, brother. <laughs> It, is, it, was, it was also the time that they would name the child. They would name the child. This would be eight days after the child is born. Naming a child is more significant than what we, we do today. We name our children largely because of what it's so like and it's so nice. They name their children for significance. The significance would be either what they hope that the child would turn out to be, or it would be significant in terms of um, the parental name. So it was time to name the baby. And they were about to name the baby, the Bible says, but we have run out of time, so... We will see you next week. Um, no, we're seeing you Sunday. Seeing you Sunday. Sunday, 8 a.m. as we continue our theme, um, contending for the faith. Contending for the faith. And we're looking at the churches in Revelation. So see you on Sunday, 8 o'clock and at 10. God bless you until then. <laughs>